Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, Or and Chiara, and for organizing. Uh, and thanks to Martino Center for organizing these really nice talks. Uh, it was wonderful to see all the, uh, the backlog of talks on YouTube, and, uh, uh, and it's quite nerve-wracking, actually, to uh, be um, <laughs> one name amongst uh, all those great names that were here before me. So my talk is about diffusion imaging, and I thought I would start by framing it, uh, beginning talking about diffusion modeling. So what do, we, what do we do when we do diffusion modeling? <coughs> there is something called the standard model of diffusion, uh, which I guess one of the previous speakers, Dmitry Novikov, coined this term for diffusion. Uh, and that is that the signal is a, <coughs> a sum, uh, arithmetic sum of uh, signals from different compartments, such as axons, intracellular space, extracellular space, free water cells, etc. <clears throat> and each of these <coughs> compartments can be modeled as a, a, a convolution of something called the orientation distribution and something called the response function. So the response function is just what does the signal look like in each of these compartments and if that signal happens to depend on the gradient orientations of, of our diffusion uh, encoding, uh, then, um, then we are uh, convolved by this orientation distribution. So, for example, we might have a model that says our orientation distribution is just a Dirac along a single orientation, modeling a bunch of axons all running in the same direction, and the response function is something Gaussian-like, which um, exponentially decays as a function of the b-value, diffusion coefficient, and the angle with the gradients. Or it could be that our orientation distribution is a uniform on the sphere, and our response function is just an exponential decay. So that would be a model for free water, for example, or any isotropic diffusion. And there are a number of different ways of um, improving on these. So for example, you can have higher order terms in terms of the B value to model maybe more complex diffusion, or you can have more complex orientation distributions, for example, fitting spherical harmonics, a free form types of uh, orientation distributions. And these, these kinds of two quantities, the orientation distribution and the response function, kind of summarize the two, two fields in diffusion modeling. One that is interested in tractography and connectivity, uh, and one that is interested in microstructure modeling. And often in tractography and connectivity, microstructure is a compound that is Im important to take into account, but not of direct interest. Whereas in the microstructure modeling world, I would say the orientation distribution is a compound that is not directly of interest, but important to account for. <clears throat> and so these two fields have gone on and produced quite a lot of things. For example, on the left, you can look at uh, contrast within the white matter that tell you, tells you about uh, orientation of fibers. Uh, you, you can use that to reconstruct white matter bundles in, in vivo, uh, using also this connectivity information to parcelate the brain into regions that have different connections. Uh, or looking at uh, connectomes, either parcellated or dense connectomes in the brain. And on the right-hand side, uh, there's a lot of work as well. Uh, for example, work in, uh, in fitting axon diameters to, uh, to diffusion data, or work in, uh, in modeling uh, neurites or axons and dendrites, such as the, the Nolly model. But of course, these two fields also have open questions or, or uh, open problems. For example, there's the question of precision of ac or accuracy of connections, uh, how many false positives, negatives, how to deal with those, uh, what, what actually is the spatial resolution, uh, is it actually um, subvoxel or not, or can we just talk about connectivity between big parcels? And in general, is it anywhere near what you can get with traces? And on the right-hand side, you also have questions, open problems. Uh, you can fit model, uh, co you can come up with complex biophysical models, but the data is rather simple and smooth, particularly if, um, uh, if you only use like, traditional diffusion encoding. Is it actually quantitative or semi-quantitative? If the models are complex and you need to fix a subset of the parameters, then it becomes a little bit semi-quantitative. Are we actually modeling the quantities of interest to uh, understand the biology, and is it anywhere near histology? And so I thought that today I would 
give four talks in instead of one. Hopefully, each of these talks is short and, uh, and I won't talk for more than an hour. The downside of this approach is that uh, I don't have a single thread that's going through the whole talk, uh, but rather four separate threads. But the upside of that is that if you're not interested in one or two of these, then you can doze off and wait for the next to, to come about. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, split into these two kind of subfields, the connectomic field in yellow and the microstructure field in blue. I'm going to talk about um, uh, some of the progress we making, uh, we've been making recently in, uh, in trying to address the open issues I just mentioned earlier. And most of the, uh, this work is unpublished. In, in fact, as we move through the different topics, it's going to become less and less published and therefore less and less polished. And so I, I value your, your inputs uh, on these. And so I'm going to talk about um, how, how we, uh, we can model gyral white matter to uh, reduce something called the gyral bias. I'm going to talk about some ideas uh, on how we can leverage the tracer data to improve tractography. I'm going to talk about some new MRI sequence we came up with to, uh, to model myelin orientation distribution. And finally, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, how we can model change in complex microstructural models. But before I move forward, I want to, uh, so I do have an acknowledgement section at the end, but I would like to acknowledge my um, postdoc, Michel Cotard, who's absolutely amazing. And most of the things I'll be talking about today are uh, uh, his work in the last few years. Uh, and also a PhD student, Hossein Afipo, whose uh, uh, work I'll be talking about at the end of the, uh, as the fourth topic. <clears throat> okay, so let's dive in, modeling gyral white matter. This is a picture of a gyrus uh, in the human brain. It's a polarized light imaging, uh, which you all are probably familiar with. And uh, what you can see is that the fibers are doing what you expect them to do as they enter gray matter, which is that it's not total chaos, but the fibers kind of uh, gently turn into um, uh, the cortex. But in diffusion, we have something called the gyro bias, which, is, which means that the um, our tractography algorithms favor, uh, favor connecting to the gyral crime more than to the walls or sulci. And we think that is because the diffusion signal is dominated by fibers running <coughs> along the, the gyrus and the, the fibers that are peeling off towards the cortex are minority and uh, our models are not sensitive uh, to those, so our measurements aren't. And in fact, there are two gyral biases, uh, one that is on the surface and one that is on the volume. So if you imagine seeding tractography from the, from the volumes or from deep white matter, uh, and you do that uniformly in the volume, you're gonna end up with a, a bias on the surface where these lines are closer to one another at the top than they are on the sides. And so you have higher density here than you have here. But you also have the same bias if you sample uniformly from the surface. You, uh, you, you, you then get a bias in the volume where streamlines tend to hug the cortex and you get a, a denser connectivity near the cortex than you do uh, in the middle there. And this is just a, um, a kind of real data uh, experiments uh, uh, showing exactly the same point. On the top, you have uh, tractography uh, volume seeded, so seeded from the white matter. And you can see that uh, the density here looks fine, but it looks like there's a clear bias on the surface. Conversely, if you see it from the surface, you can actually control the number of streamlines you see from each vertex, and therefore you have uniform density here. But as you can see, uh, you, you get these um, streamlines having the cortex and, and non-uniformly sampling the white matter. So both are an issue. Of course, we do expect to see some gyral bias uh, because if you look at the geometry of a cortex and you look at uh, equal volume sections of the gray matter, the, 
the bit that touches the, the white matter has a smaller surface area here than it does here. And therefore you would expect a higher surface density on the cortex. And so what I'm talking about here is volume density rather than surface density, or density per, per volume of gray matter. Now, we can't really solve that by only utilizing the diffusion data because I don't think the signal is there. And so we do need some, to add some anatomical constraints. And what you can do, for example, is uh, simply constrain both surface and volume density to be uniform. Uh, and then you get some picture like this. You can further constrain it by saying, okay, well, I think the streamlines are going to end up perpendicular to the gray matter. You can get something more and more realistic without even fitting any diffusion data, you get a realistic picture. And notice that all of these four uh, may fit the data equally well, at least the, these two plus this and this one may fit the data equally well. So uh, by adding these anatomical constraints, it's, it's not like we're not, we don't have a data fidelity aspect. And one further motivation for uh, having these kinds of constraints comes from tracer data. So this is data from Suzanne Haver, which uh, recently moved to Boston. And uh, whenever she injects traces uh, in the cortex, what she notices is that tracts follow this uh, so-called stalk uh, until they reach deep white matter where they disperse. And so it's not, uh, there isn't so much chaos happening inside the gyrus as, uh, uh, as, as we might think. And so what we thought we would do is to come up with a continuous model of white matter inside the gyrus. And uh, there's an, we have an illustration of that here on the right hand side. So what this model assumes is that uh, there is no crossing fibers, so it's just a single orientation per continuous point x in the gyrus, or x, y, z. And the second assumption we'll make is that there are no fibers terminating in the white matter. So mathematically, uh, this boils down to a continuous vector field F where fiber orientation is given by um, the normalized F and fiber density is given by the modulus of F. And not terminating in the white matter can be mathematically described by a divergence-free field. So how do we create a divergence-free field? The first idea we had, which turned out to be quite a bad idea, which, which was to use electrostatic fields. So this is a, uh, so that means you could uh, stick um, uh, points, uh, uh, positive, positive charges uh, in the cortex and negative charges, uh, one negative charge in the white matter or vice versa, and each charge uh, of creates a uh, radial field, so it's radial, so it's nice and divergence free. You add them together, you get a divergence free field, and your free parameters are just the uh, charges, which you can fit to diffusion data. But this is bad because it's, each charge affects the field everywhere, so it's really not a sparse uh, problem. It, it's, um, it's, it's not a local problem. We wanted something that's, uh, that was local, so we can invert it much more efficiently over the whole brain. And so the second idea was to use local dipoles, which are depicted here. So these are divergence-free dipoles. How do you make them? You make them by, you start with a radial function. So this is a function that only depends on the distance from the center of this dipole and not on the x, y, z coordinates independently. And to make, to turn this scalar function into a divergence-free field, one trick you can do is to take uh, the derivatives of this function with respect to x, y, and z in this form. So this vector here, um, it looks a little bit complicated, but if, if you kind of um, take the x derivative here, y derivative here, z derivative here, and add up, it adds up to zero. So it's kind of a divergence-free field. You can do that uh, in three different ways. So you get a, a triplet of vectors. Any combination A, B, C of these vectors gives you an F. And so you have A, B, C as three parameters, which you can fit uh, in terms of the magnitude and orientation um, of this uh, field locally to this dipole. And I'll, uh, <coughs> if you take a dipole like that and, and add it to a, a field that has straight lines, you can see here how the dipole modifies the underlying field 
So uh, uh, you can change the orientation or you can change the strength. Uh, and you can see that uh, it gives you kind of a lot of freedom in fitting any, any given uh, orientation field. So going back to our gyrus, what you can then do uh, is, um, is have a bunch of these dipoles uh, dispersed throughout the gyrus. Uh, and this, this is shown here in 2D, but you have to imagine it in, in 3D. And, uh, and then that, that uh, gives you a, a continuous divergence-free field, which you can fit to the diffusion data again by fitting these three parameters, A, B, and C. Uh, of course, you need a cost function if you want to fit anything. Uh, and a cost function could include something about fitting to the diffusion data, uh, something about uh, having a smooth volume density or a target surface density. So for example, um, uh, on the cortex, we want uh, each volume of cortex to, um, to have equal density. And you can also add uh, in the cost function uh, some anatomical prior uh, being orthogonal to the surface. And in fact, this is all, uh, all, all of these cost functions have been implemented. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a link to the code later. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, this kind of um, cost function says, well, I want to align my field F with some predefined field G, but I don't care about the sign. It could be, a, it could be along G or, or, uh, or the opposite direction. And that's the kind of thing you may use to feed the diffusion data, which is not directional. Or you can use this one. Uh, to say, well, I want, I want the field to be uh, perpendicular to the surface, but going outwards towards the outside of the brain. So you can use something directional like this. Okay, uh, so here are some results from fitting this to the diffusion data. Uh, on the left-hand side is uh, the cost function for aligning with the, the DTI primary eigenvector. Uh, you can see we only fit in this model in the gyral white matter and not elsewhere. And uh, the, the point to take from this is that uh, the values are close to one, which means our field aligns with the DTI primary eigenvector. And here you can see uh, the surface radiality, uh, which uh, uh, quantifies how perpendicular to the surface you are and uh, values are close to one. There are different subjects in different colors. Uh, and here uh, is the um, then the density per cortical volume, streamlines per cortical volume in the, in the um, gray white matter boundary, showing that uh, we get rid of the gyro bias. Uh, and here coming back again to this, um, to this picture of the surface bias and the volume bias, if you use this gyro model, you actually get rid of, of both. So you don't get so much of a bias on the surface, but you also don't get these. Um, streamlines hugging the, the cortex, this, uh, this volume bias that you see here at the bottom. Some more results uh, on real data. This experiment looks at cortical cortical connections, so long range connections between the two hemispheres. And on the bottom, you can see that um, uh, when you see it from either the fundus, the wall, or the crown, and your target is the fundus, wall, or crown. Wherever you see it from, you end up in the crown and you get this massive crown bias, uh, which, uh, which is gone here. I mean, you still have a crown bias, but it is less so than here. Uh, and it's also symmetric. It doesn't matter whether you, you see it from the seed or from the target, or, or you, whether you counted the seed or the, or the target. Uh, another way to look at gyro bias is to look for borders between areas that have different connections. So what this map shows is uh, uh, similarities between adjacent vertices in terms of their connectivity profile to the rest of the brain. And you can see these um, red lines are transitions between one profile and another. And they tend to align with the, uh, with the gyrification, the uh, sulcal patterns. Um, and that's caused by, by this gyral bias. And so when you, when you use this gyral model, you don't you don't get so much of these, um, uh, of these sharp borders at the trial crowns. And finally, we, uh, we were curious to see how it compared to uh, resting state fMRI connectivity. So here are four examples of um, looking at connectivity from the blue arrows there, uh, using this dipole model versus using the traditional model. 
we deliberately were looking here for um, seed points that were, for example, at the gyral wall or the sol sulci, where you get a little bit of a sparse connectivity profile on the right, but you get the uh, a nice correspondence with resting state of MRI on the, on the left, or in the middle. Okay, <clears throat> so that's end of part one. The paper is on bioarchive, hopefully soon in your image. The code is here, uh, so you can go and play with it if you like. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that was the uh, child bias. Next topic is learning from traces. So uh, I think this audience is probably familiar with what traces are. You just inject a compound uh, in the brain of an animal and, uh, and then this compound is uh, actively transport, transported inside the axons. And that gives us information, ground truth, you know, gold standard information on connectivity. And it's really detailed, it can be really detailed. For example, you, by using retrograde traces and looking for cell bodies that connect to the target, to the injection site, you can say things like which cortical layers connect to, to uh, or where, which cortical layers connect to which cortical layers. You can also have quantitative information. So for example, here, what I'm showing is the uh, so-called fraction of labeled neurons or the fractions of, of cells from all of these regions at the bottom that send axons to V1 in the macaque brain. And what you notice is that this uh, quanti quanti of quantity of cells spans five or six order, orders of magnitudes, which means that you can quantify the very strong connections, but also the very weak ones. But actually, if you, uh, if you also do tractography in the macaque and compare that to traces, so counting streamlines rather than cells, you also span five orders of magnitudes, and it correlates really nicely with the traces. This is a study by Chad Donahue and David Vanessen and others. But the problem with this picture is that it, what it is hiding is that the connectivity strength also depends on how far away the seed is to the target. So for both traces and for tractography, you have this um, exponential decay in connection strength as a function of connection length. And so the question is, do we make more mistakes here or do we make more mistakes here? Uh, and so you can look at that uh, and look at false positives versus negatives versus uh, correct classification uh, or correct connections as a function of distance from the seed. Uh, and what you notice is that we make more mistakes as the connections get longer, which is to be expected. It's not, uh, they're not all, it's not all bad. Uh, there's a lot of green still, but we still have lots of red and blue. So how can we improve that? Well, uh, well why, one reason why we do get uh, false positives has been nicely illustrated in this paper by Maya Hain et al. Uh, and what they did was um, they created fake data sets, fake diffusion data sets by uh, by doing the, the reverse of what people do with tractography. So instead of going from diffusion data to, to tracts, they went from tracts to diffusion data, gave that data to um, the community and said, can you reconstruct the tracts that we put in there? And many people found these, uh, these connections that were anatomically plausible, but weren't there in the data set to begin with, simulated data. And the reason for that is, once streamlines go into a, uh, a location where they intersect with one another or tracts intersect with one another, the tractography algorithms don't know where to go or which streamlines to pick. And so you have this track jumping, which can only be resolved, resolved by, uh, by injecting some priors as to where, where to, uh, to go next. And so I think this is the kind of priors that we can get from traces. But how do we transfer these no, this knowledge from traces to humans? It seems to me that uh, one approach is to have this common space where we can put both brains and then we can uh, uh, learn from traces to do better tractography in the, in, in the macaque, but in a way that is transferable to the human. 
So what do I mean by common space? Well, one way to create this common space, it's kind of a, one way to project both brains into the same space is to consider the, the underlying white matter. The white matter is remarkably well preserved between these species. Uh, so pretty much everywhere in the brain, you can uh, identify a tract and give it the same name across, right, uh, across these uh, high order primates. So you, uh, uh, for example, here you have the arcuate fasciculus. The core is very similar, the branches less so. Uh, and so as long as you can identify the core reliably across species and, uh, and hopefully reconstruct those branches accurately, then, uh, then you, have, you have something that you can match between them. And the accurate is not the only tract. Uh, this uh, study by Michel Thibault, the short end shows that you can do that for many different white matter tracts. You can identify them with simple tractography rules. And so we, um, we created this tool recently called Extract. Uh, so this is work by Sean Warrington with the huge input from our experts, uh, primate anal uh, anatomists, Catherine Bryant and Rocky Maas, and our experts, uh, diffusion guru, Stan Sotiropoulos. And what it does is that uh, it just implements these rules, but they were kind of handcrafted rules to extract these, these uh, pathways automatically from the data. But it does so in a way that is matched between humans and macaques and hopefully more species to come. So an extract, the X stands for cross species. Uh, and as I said, this is based on this old tractography idea that um, if you want to reconstruct a pathway, uh, you have to tell the tractography where to go and where not to go. So having reconstructed these pathways, what you can then go and do is map on the cortex, which uh, map their projections onto the cortex. So for example, uh, for um, the Arcus fasciculus, you can get a, a map that tells you what's the highest probability uh, vertices on the cortex that send connections via the Arcus fasciculus, uh, and similarly for other tracts. And if you look at each vertex individually, what you have is a fingerprint of tracts. So you, uh, you, for example, here, this, um, this point in the frontal lobe seems to have um, uh, large projections via the SLF3 and 2, but not so much uh, ILF, for example. Uh, and uh, blue and black here are the left and the right hemisphere. You can see nice symmetry, but also some interesting asymmetries. Now, armed with these tracts across species, uh, what you then have is a cortex by tract matrix, where the cortex dimension is not matched, but the tract dimension is. And so you have this common space that is made out of these tracts, and you can go on and uh, for each vertex in the human brain, try to identify vertices in macaque that best uh, match in terms of their tractography pathways and vice versa. Here's an example of this idea uh, in play for um, identifying one specific area, which is human area MT, which is located here. If you uh, look at its connectivity fingerprints or tracked fingerprints, uh, that's the, the blue curve here. You can just go on to, onto the macaque cortex and identify all, air, all the vertices on the brain that have a similar blue, uh, fingerprint. And you'll find the, the red vertices here um, satisfied. And, it, um, uh, and this area, which is the uh, best match to human area MT in terms of the tract, happens to be in the same place as uh, the histology defined area MT in, the, in macaque. So that works uh, quite well. And you can do that across the whole brain, like I said. Uh, so here, for example, you can see a matrix that tells you how similar each broadman area in the human is to another broadman area in macaque. And, um, and uh, blue uh, values are kind of low values. And so uh, uh, you can do some kind of simple spectral uh, embedding of this matrix into a 2D. Uh, you can visualize the two brains in the same space. Uh, and that's your common space where you can then start to take rules from one uh, and apply it to the other. 
Now going back to traces, uh, what obviously you can also do tractography in the macaque and compare it to traces. This is a, an example of such thing where um, the injection site is around here and you can see the um, uh, pathways. This is data from Suzanne Haber's lab where they really carefully reconstructed the whole trajectory of the, of the traces and not just the endpoints. And you can see it's doing something quite complicated going to the right turn into the thalamus turn in, and going down to the brainstem, etc. And the tractography is doing the same thing. But uh, what I had to do in order to match that is I had to inject some, some priors to extract this specific pathway, but without biasing it too much. So I think that's the kind of thing that we can do. We can inject priors into the tracking based on macaque tracer data, but doing it in such a way that isn't, that, that isn't overfitting. And, uh, Resources for doing so are coming. Uh, there's some awesome HCP quality data for the macaque coming from Takuya Hayashi's lab. Uh, there's a kind of papers coming up describing the data here at the bottom if you're interested. This is a recent study by Kurt Schilling showing that um, if you compare track, tractography and traces, uh, you get these kinds of uh, sensitivity specificity plots. Uh, but if you inject a little bit of priors into the tractography, you get the black star here, which is much improved uh, outcome. And so what, we, what do we need? We need lots of tracer data. Uh, and there is, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of it out there, but not a lot of it is digitized. So with Suzanne Haber, we're trying to digitize her entire collection, which is 40 years worth of data. Uh, with hundreds of, uh, of cases uh, and, uh, and lots of um, brain coverage with um, Nissen stains as well to, to look for uh, laminar connections. Uh, this is where the injections are in her data collection. She, she's, um, she's, she's quite fond of the frontal cortex and the striatum. Uh, if you're interested in the visual cortex, this database is not for you, but there are others out there uh, for example, CocoMac database, the awesome Markov and Kennedy data, which is already out there. And so hopefully by digitizing more and more of these traces da tracer data, we can combine them together to cover, to cover the whole brain in the future. Uh, and so uh, after digitization, we need to identify cells. So we're doing some machine learning uh, and deep learning to uh, automatically go through the slides and find the cells and, uh, and hopefully map, map this information onto a, 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 a macaque atlas. And to do, to do so, we need to register histology to, uh, to MRI. Uh, and for that, we're using uh, this uh, new F-cell tool. I'm doing some uh, advertising here as well as uh, talking about the science. I'm really sorry. Uh, so there's a new, new tool in F-cell called TURL, uh, developed by the awesome Istvan Kuzar. Uh, and what it does is um, it does histology to MR registration, but it also can do things like taking a small section of a brain and taking it all the way to, uh, to the entire volume. So we've used this on our macaque data and uh, the results look uh, really promising. So this one is a student of uh, Mark Jenkinson and Carla Miller and this, this data comes from uh, Amy Howard. And so I don't yet have a uh, <coughs> results uh, for this approach, it's just a uh, an idea for now, uh, a roadmap. So we're doing this bit uh, using machine learning to map trace data onto an atlas of connectivity that is as dense as possible across the brain. Uh, then we'll use that to come up with rules that are generalizable and no, uh, not overfitting to uh, improve tractography and transfer that to humans via this common space uh, approach. That's the dream anyway. So that was part two. Uh, I hope people are still there and can still hear me, but uh, tell me if you're not. <laughs> so the third section is um, about uh, imaging myelin and, and uh, orientation distribution. So uh, as I said in my introduction, there's um, a whole field uh, looking at microstructural modeling with diffusion MRI. Uh, and one thing that is, uh, quite exciting in that field, this idea of mapping axon diameter, probably starting with the work from Yaniv Asaf in 2008, 
where they used um, a very uh, comprehensive diffusion sampling of gradients and diffusion times where you can uh, where you can get really precise signatures of small versus big axons uh, with with this kind of um, high spec uh, scanners and recently work from uh, Yelve Hart and uh, and Novikov uh, and, and, and those people uh, have shown that uh, you actually don't really don't necessarily need to do this uh, uh, Q sampling and time sampling, but what you need is strong gradients so you can change the p value. Uh, and so if you look at your signal as a function of the square root of the p value, uh, or one over square roots, uh, so the p value is going up as you go into the left. Uh, if your axons uh, are stick-like, you get a straight line, but if you, they start to diverge from a stick, you get a little bit of a curvature, which you can detect if you if you have strong enough gradients. Uh, and so uh, you can get what you can get then is a uh, not, not so much an axon radius distribution, but it's more of a um, uh, sensitivity to the tail of that distribution. So that's exciting. But if you, but if you actually look at, uh, uh, so the reason why people are interested in axon diameter is because they're important for conduction speed and therefore biolo biologically really relevant. But what's even more relevant for conduction speed is myelin. If you have a unmyelinated versus myelinated axon, the, the, the difference in that uh, small increases in diameter make are massive. But if you look at the diameters of myelinated versus unmyelinated axons, the overlap is really big. And so, and so what matters really is the myelin to me and not so much the, the diameter. And people know that already. Uh, uh, and what's, what's also striking is that although the G ratio is uh, relatively preserved across the white matter, there is also some variability. And this amount of variability kind of translates into massive variability in the conduction speeds. And so we should be looking at myelin and we should be looking at the, uh, 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 which, which axons have which amount of myelin rather than just focusing on diameter. Yes, so I think myelin wins in this contest as to which is more important. Uh, so how do you measure myelin? Uh, there's there's a, whole, a very, very large literature measuring myelin. Uh, and this literature is really nicely summarized in this paper where they, they looked at which of the myelin measures actually correlates with histological measures of myelin. Uh, and they've created this uh, kind of interactive interface where you can interrogate the literature, look through the papers, look at uh, different measures, uh, how many samples, su how many subjects did they have, what was the R square, uh, with which histological measures, etc., etc. It's really, really neat study. Uh, this is also a summary of the results, looking at R square versus MRI measures. Uh, some of them are very indirect, like diffusion measures, and some of them are more direct, like MTR, etc. And so the, the question we wanted to address is this one. We wanted to know whether there was a way to separate, for example, myelinated axons from unmyelinated axons inside a voxel. So we know that we can use some of these techniques to measure the amount of myelin in, in the voxel, but what we really want to know is how much myelin is running in different directions? Can we have an orientation distribution for, for myelinated axons and unmyelinated axons? Or can we say something about the G ratio along a specific direction? So for us, that meant somehow combining diffusion with myelin measurements. And this is kind of happening a little bit already. So the, the first idea one might have is to combine diffusion with relaxation techniques. Uh, and that's something people sometimes refer to as multidimensional diffusion, uh, where basically you change the echo time as well as the E value, and you have these 2D plots of diffusion coefficient versus T2. But we think that um, it's, it's not a good way to do it because mining water is very short, uh, and, and therefore it's gone by the time you have some diffusion waiting. And also it doesn't really tell us about the unknown unmyelinated axons on which we don't have much data in the human brain because they, uh, they're not generally preserved in, uh, in, 
in histology. And so we thought we should, rather than use uh, relaxation, instead use susceptibility imaging. And uh, it's well known that uh, myelin affects susceptibility. So you can see here the difference between controls uh, and shiver mice. Uh, the in, the um, contrast is in the, white, in the white matter is completely gone, as well as the myelin uh, sheets. And so we thought we would do that instead. So uh, DP, diffusion prepared phase imaging, is a sequence we proposed that um, uh, gives you this sensitivity, uh, so the, these two degrees of sensitivity to orientation and to uh, myelin. And here's the sequence. So it combines standard uh, stage Tana sequence, or any kind of diffusion weighting here uh, can be used. Uh, there's two readouts, uh, and there's an asymmetric spin echo on the right-hand side to measure phase. So the reason, uh, the reason we're doing uh, phase imaging is, uh, is because the, uh, uh, we know that the frequency uh, locally is dependent on myelin, but, it's, but the relationship with, uh, uh, with myelination is particularly simple inside myelinated axons where you have this uh, frequency uh, linearly dependent on the log G ratio and the angle with, uh, with the main magnetic field. And so the diffusion weighting gives you two things. Actually, it gives you, uh, with high, B value, high enough B value, it gives you increased sensitivity to intra-axonal space. And so you get this really nice simple relationship with, uh, with, uh, um, with the log G ratio. And also, obviously, it gives you sensitivity to orientation. So you can null signal that is uh, uh, not of interest when, uh, along some orientation when you're looking at the orientations that are of interest. But there's uh, serious issues with this sequence, uh, uh, or in theory with this sequence, which is uh, uh, it might be sensitive to motion, uh, eddy currents, and other sources of susceptibility that, it, that aren't uh, myelin. And so for, uh, for motion, we, uh, we, we have these two readouts. And so it's, the, uh, it's really the, uh, uh, what's happening between these two readouts that is important to us. And so anything that happens here in the diffusion weighting is not uh, uh, is not relevant. So, and so motion is not a, a problem here. Eddy currents are a problem because the eddy currents induced by these gradients affect the first readout and the second readout differently. And so uh, I'll just briefly touch on that. We've done some phantom experiments where we, um, we're looking at, uh, at these eddy currents effects uh, in an isotropic phantom. And what we do doing here is we're modeling the eddy currents along different gradient orientations using spherical harmonics. And what I'm showing at the bottom is the, um, the um, power in these spherical harmonics, either, either between the two echoes or, or, or during the, um, uh, that second echo. Uh, but the, uh, what you can see is that it's the odd spherical harmonic coefficients that are much larger than the even ones. And so what that means is that we can model them using odd spherical harmonics, which is really convenient because our diffusion signal is uh, is uh, symmetric, uh, and so uh, uh, only cares about the even spherical harmonics, so we can use the odd ones to uh, model out the effects of eddy currents. So here's some results. Uh, so far, we've only done that phantom and some uh, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, because the, by the time the sequence was ready, we went into lockdown, and so I don't have any in vivo data to show you. Uh, but these simulations, uh, in this first simulation, we, um, uh, we simulate uh, two crossing fibers with an average log, uh, G ratio of 0.8, uh, and, um, and by, uh, uh, and, and by kind of, uh, rotating the sample, if you like, either parallel or perpendicular, uh, either with the fibers parallel or perpendicular to the main P nodes, by combining those two information, those two informations you can solve for log G. What you can also do is change this T phase here, and that gives you an extra sensitivity to uh, determining the, not only the G ratio, but also the fraction of myelinated versus unmyelinated fibers. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of the 
talk on the fourth topic, uh, which is modeling change in complex models. And for this, I'll come back to uh, my intro slide where I talked about the uh, standard model of diffusion and compartments and the um, idea of a orientation distribution and a response function. So this response function, as I said, is where the good stuff is as far as microstructure is, is concerned. You get diffusion coefficients, axon radii, volume fractions, myelination, etc. Uh, and once you fit that, uh, one uh, 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 once you fit that to a voxel uh, in a subject, you're interested in seeing how that quantity might change, uh, for example, in disease or between subject or in aging, etc. Here's a random example of such thing where uh, in the UK Biobank, uh, some people in our lab have looked at the genetic correlates of uh, uh, one of the nodding parameters, intracellular volume fraction, and you can see throughout white matter uh, that um, this quantity across uh, the 10,000 subjects, I think, or 40,000 uh, correlates with this particular gene. But the problem with, one pro problem with Nodi is that it is, uh, uh, it makes quite a lot of assumptions. For example, the diffusivities are fixed. They're not fitted to the data, because otherwise it, it is a, uh, uh, an under-constrained problem. Uh, and recently we've, um, we've played a little bit with Nodi with the, a connectome scanner from uh, Derek Jones's lab, uh, looking at high B value data where you can null the, uh, the extracellular signal and, uh, and get a, uh, an estimate of this uh, diffusivity. And in fact, it mu it's much larger, the diffusivity, the axonal diffusivity is much larger than what is assumed in Nodi, which means that uh, and when, you, when you make that change and, and, uh, and, and to the axonal diffusivity, intracellular volume fraction can change by as much as 150%. And so that means we, uh, uh, we are making strong assumptions here and, uh, and the, uh, that limits what we can say about individual differences in these, uh, in these parameters. And so one idea, uh, so, the, the, so the, the common approach to um, to do in this microstructure modeling and then comparing between subjects is to take each data set uh, separately invert a microstructure model to get a to get a distribution across these subjects and then compare these two distribution so there is a model inversion here for each and every single voxel so we thought maybe instead of inverting these models and making strong assumptions so that they're not ill posed uh, we could, uh, we could compare the data directly or summary measures of the data. And then from, from the, the differences observed in the data, deduce something about which parameters may have changed. And the reason we think that this may be uh, a solution to circumvent ill-posed models is illustrated here. So what you have on the left is some depiction of uh, parameter space, and here's a depiction of measure measurement space. So to make this concrete, these measurements might be anisotropy and signal attenuation, and the parameters might be uh, diffusion coefficient and volume fraction. And what this figure shows is that this model is, uh, is ill-posed, so the, um, although the circle, the blue and the red circles are well separated in parameter space, they make the same prediction as to where the data is. Same for squares, same for stars. And so the inverse problem is still posed. But if we're only looking, if we're only interested in the change, so what, uh, what has changed for, uh, when going from circle to square versus what has changed when going from circle to stars, uh, these are well defined in parameter space. And so it's kind of a sensitivity analysis, if you like, that we're looking for rather than inversion and then an analysis. Uh, so we've um, created a kind of mathematical framework for this that we call bench for Bayesian, analysis, Bayesian estimation of change. And the way it works is um, uh, we try to calculate the probability that a parameter, which I call S, uh, has changed given the data and the change in the data. 
And with Bayes' rule, you can invert that uh, into probability of changing data, given the data and the parameter, which you then uh, integrate over all possible amounts of changes. And I'm not going to go too much into the details of the, the methodology, uh, but uh, rather illustrate it in the pictorially. So what, uh, what you can do is uh, uh, take some data, which is a function of some known parameters, change one of these parameters at a time, uh, look at what the, how the data has changed, uh, and do that multiple times <coughs> uh, for different values of these parameters, but also these different values of these changes. And what you get is some uh, distribution of possible uh, values uh, of the uh, delta y de that is dependent on, uh, on which parameters, parameter has changed. And crucially, you don't need inversions to, uh, to fit models to, to these uh, ellipsoids. Uh, you only need the forward model, so kind of simulation based, if you like. Uh, you can also have a uh, situation where there is no change except for some noise. And so what, what you can do then is, uh, uh, is use simulations to fit these models. And then once you've uh, fitted those models, you go into the real data, look at changes in the data or the summary measures of the data and deduce from that which parameters more likely to have changed. Uh, so I'll finish by showing some results on applying this to two models, one that is called the ball and stick, which has four parameters and is nicely invertible, and one which I call extended NODI, which has um, actually many more parameters than standard NODI, uh, <coughs> and keeping in mind that in NODI only three or four of these parameters are, uh, are fitted and the, remain, the remaining parameters are fixed. Uh, here we are uh, we allowing all the parameters to, uh, to vary. <clears throat> so here's some results uh, in, uh, in the form of a confusion matrix where uh, we've simulated some change in uh, say one of four parameters uh, and uh, trying to see which, um, which parameters we think have changed. And on the left hand side I'm showing a standard inversion which means that you just take the data, invert the models, and then look to see uh, which parameter has changed uh, with, with a t-test. Then on the right-hand side is this Bayesian model of change. And so you can see that uh, uh, at least for the ball and stick model, both perform reasonably well in the sense that the predicted change uh, corresponds uh, well with the actual change. Uh, one exception is this uh, d-iso, which is the isotropic diffusion coefficient, uh, which is quite high in this, in this uh, simulation. And therefore, uh, the data doesn't actually, isn't actually sensitive to that compartment. And that's why uh, this model says, well, actually, there's no change. So it's the empty set uh, that is more likely than uh, a change in the eyes. And here's uh, the extended NODI result where the standard inversion doesn't work at all uh, because it's a, such a degenerate model. Anything can happen. Uh, but we, uh, we're still able to, um, to detect changes. Uh, particularly true for these volume fraction parameters. There is some confusion between the diffusivities, but that's to be expected. Uh, and again, uh, it's the ISO being uh, quite big. Uh, the model, the data doesn't have sensitivity and therefore the model says there is no change uh, given the SNR in the data. You can also look at how, uh, uh, how uh, add these things as a function of the effect size so as you increase effect size, uh, you start going from no change to detecting the, act, the, the parameter that has actually changed. And finally, uh, going back to this de-iso being big and the data not uh, supporting the change, uh, what you can do is then make some simulations where you add uh, a small shell, for example, a B300 shell where the, um, this, uh, there's still signal in it that's sensitive to de-iso. And, and you start to recover uh, the change in this parameter. So what this shows is that you could potentially use this, this kind of framework to do, to do uh, design experiments uh, tailored to your microstructure model uh, if you're interested in particular parameters changing. Uh, and same for the, uh, the extended NODI model. Okay, so uh, I don't have a one thread summary slide because I gave four talks rather than one. And so uh, I just want to finish by uh, reminding you the topics that I've uh, uh, covered today, modeling general white matter, learning from traces, 
the mild orientation distribution and the model of change. I hope some of it interested you and I look forward to your questions. I finished with a huge thanks again to Michel Kotar and Hossein Rafipour, uh, whose work I presented today, but also massive thanks to all my collaborators in Oxford and, uh, and not in Oxford and to the funders. And thank you for listening. I look forward to the questions.